From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Good afternoon, Riverside. I'm honored to be with you as we observe and lament together on this holy day in the church calendar. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only two of the four gospels record these last words of Christ. I wonder if it's not because these are some of the most difficult words of Jesus to process. More than the parables, more than stern warnings or prophecies, those we can explain by Jesus being Jesus. But both our heads and our hearts struggle with God turning God's back on Jesus, with God forsaking God. It's a theologically messy idea to wade through, but it is into this messiness that we are invited to dig our hands in and do the work. As humans, we equate God with power. It is an almost inescapable equation. At our most basic understanding, having power means we are the ones who don't lose. We are the ones who get to not hurt. When we contemplate a God who hurts, who is forsaken, who suffers, that completely upends our understanding of God. It shakes the solid theological ground we stand on. And if we're honest, it disturbs our own sense of safety, because if God allows God's own self to suffer, what may come of us? That's an, un that's an unsettling idea that we often rush past. As Christians, though, we're invited to sit with the notion that our God is both powerful and vulnerable to suffering. Modeled in the life of Christ and throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we're beckoned to consider a different kind of power, power not based in might or abject control, but rooted deeply in love, a love that opens the lover up to the possibility of suffering for their love's sake. To love completely is to be vulnerable, even for the divine. In following the leader, as Pastor Thorne has urged us throughout this Lenten season, we too have been invited to live out our lives in this call to vulnerable love as Christ did. It's a dangerous place to be for sure, because in this broken world, it opens the lover up to so many opportunities for pain. We are bid to align our lives and our loves with what God loves, and in so doing, allow ourselves to become vulnerable to suffering. When we join God in the messy, creative, redemptive work of laboring to do on earth as it is in heaven, we must love utterly and risk our hearts breaking. We're urged to love with such wild abandon that should we lose, or maybe even win, it will hurt. Jesus' love led him to the cross. For us, in bearing up God's image in the world, we risk embarrassment. We risk failure and having to start over again and again. We risk losing all. We are invited to put ourselves into situations in which our hearts and our dreams can be utterly shattered where our bodies and our livelihoods could be at risk, where we could be left wounded when we love others as God loves us. A new friend recently lamented one morning over coffee that it's overwhelming just to be alive sometimes, and she's right. We don't always suffer because we're Christian or because we choose love and vulnerability. Suffering can also just be part of what it means to be alive, coming to us through no choice of our own. This life will use us up and wear us out, and we don't remain safe by staying on the sidelines. Most of us will live small lives full of the normalness of the everyday, touched by both joys and sufferings. But it is in our choice 
to pour ourselves out in love rather than let life drain us away, that these small, ordinary lives become revolutionary. In the final hours of his earthly life, Jesus continued his ministry to us, teaching us how to live through suffering, from his raw, impassioned prayers in the garden, pleading for it to be a different way. And here now on the cross, crying out to God, vulnerable and earnestly seeking, Jesus continually postured himself toward the Father, towards relationship. Jesus died forsaken on the cross, unimaginably tortured and in broken relationship with the Father. But while Jesus was forsaken, we carry the promise that we will not be. Scripture assures us that although we will suffer, we will not be separated from the love of God. With that assurance, perhaps we can allow the suffering to soften us, to deepen us, and we can lean in to love. When the dream dies, when the pain remains, or the prayers of wrestling for a different outcome are fruitless, it's easier to offer a tender, bruised heart to a God who grieves. The idea that once caused anxiety, the idea that God would suffer, gives way to comfort and acceptance. To walk through the brokenness beside and not beneath an unaffected deity, but beside a deeply loving God who knows suffering, who was even resurrected in a scarred body, is powerful. Perhaps because of this, we can go forward, bearing our own scars, not as marks of failure or proof that God abandoned us, but stories that tell where our love has taken us, scars that bear witness to a life lived, answering the call to love. <laughs>